In this initial series of tutorials, we're just going to be covering the interface and operation of Rhino 3D. Rhino 3D is a very powerful 3D modeling program. It's available in educational platforms for a very inexpensive price, and it's the primary tool we're going to be using during your architectural education. If we look at the toolbar when we load everything up, you'll see that there's a series of command prompts here. This loads a lot of information and we're going to rely on this heavily as we use the program. Below that we have a series of toolbars. Here the standard toolbar has everything we need to make a new document, open, save, print. There's some options to zoom in and out. There's ways to set views, hide and show objects, lock objects, and different display modes. Outside of that there are other toolbars and say here on the set um, display we can change the rendering style if it's wireframe or not. And we'll get into that a little bit more in further tutorials. Moving on down the line, there are ways to edit curves, there are ways to edit surfaces, there are solid tools that we'll be using a lot. And as you see, as I change these toolbars, this left hand side also changes. Now, if you're on Mac, this layout might look a little different, but essentially all the tools are the same and the way we use the program is the same. Similarly, we can actually grab any of these things and move them around. We can change Rhino to be a different layout, a different user interface that works better for us. Some people prefer the command line at the top or at the bottom. Here on the right, you see there's more tabs. Right now we're looking at the properties tab. And because I have nothing selected in my viewports, I'm just looking at the viewport properties. So you can see here, I'm looking at the front view. It gives me its dimensions. It tells me a little bit of information about the camera. If I move to perspective, all of that stuff updates. And as I use right click to move around in the perspective window in orbit, you can see it tells me the camera position changes. Outside of that, we also have layers. Much like Photoshop or Illustrator, this is a great way to organize our geometry. And we'll be using layers in a very careful way to make sure that things can be turned on and off as we proceed with modeling. Beside that, we have materials, some libraries, a help menu. Rhino has a very detailed help menu, and by going into any of these things, you can learn a great deal more. Within this, you'll see that there's an explanation of the, the material I'm covering right now, and in a lot of them, you'll actually see the ability to preview. Let's look at curves here. There's a little animation that will preview exactly how to use any given tool. So if you're ever lost or confused and you don't want to reference the tutorials we've provided, you can always use the help menu built right into Rhino. One thing I prefer to do is to change my layout and properties menu so that I can see both at the same time. I'll drag with left click and pull the layers menu out. You can see now it's much larger. I'll then take it and drag it to the bottom half of the right hand side so that I can see both my layers and my properties at the same time. With layers, I can just use the checkbox and select what layer I want to model on. I can also create a new layer. I'll do that by going down to layer 5, creating a new layer, and calling this layer new. I can double click the new layer to move that checkbox here, and now I'm actively drawing and working on the new layer. If I wanted to create a new sublayer, that's a layer that exists under. So we can call this one new.a. By clicking this layer, now I'm working on new A, and I could create another layer. Because I'm active on the sublayer, it will create a layer directly in that same kind of uh, hierarchy. So we call this one new dot B. Now the dot doesn't matter. We can name this anything we'd like. We can name it, you know, layer A, layers two, layer seven. You could give it funny names. It's just a way for you to organize your information. So naming the layers in the way that makes sense to you is the best practice. Now that I'm on uh, new.b, I could create some geometry on that layer. If I wanted to, I could turn off the top layer, which will turn off everything below it. But as you can see, because I'm using new.b, and that's my active layer, I cannot turn off its parent layer. If I use the check mark and move back to layer 5, I could then click the light bulb on new, and both new a and b turn off. Conversely, if I wanted to turn off just one of them, I could do it this way, or I could also lock a layer so that nothing can be edited if it's on that layer. Layers are really, really helpful tools in organizing information, and we're going to rely on them heavily. At the bottom of the window, you'll see that there's a few other options. 
One is to turn on grid snaps. We can see these grids here, and by turning on grid snap, we can only draw along these grids. In a similar way, ortho lets us draw up and down, left and right. It doesn't allow for diagonals and curves. Um, ortho is something that must be kind of Cartesian. I'll turn ortho off by clicking it. Planar is exactly what you'd think. We're drawing on a planar surface, so it would be flat. Every control point that we put into a rectangle or curve would always be on the same level. O-Snap is a very helpful tool. So this is Object Snaps. And if I turn this on, you can see that my selections are up here. Right now I have O-Snap set up to be endpoint, near point, point, mid, and not, also vertex. And we'll look at those as we start modeling in our next tutorial. Smart Track is similar to OSNAP in that I can hover over a piece of geometry and then drag away from it, and it remembers the snap that I was hovering on, so we can get alignments. Gumball is a tool. We can look right here. Let's just make a box. So I use the command line to write box. I'll drag out a box here. And using the Gumball, you can see, if I turn that off, it goes away. The Gumball is just a little bit of a widget here that we can move the box back and forth, left and right, we can scale it and stretch it. We can change its Z dimension. We can even go in and rotate it using uh, these um, kind of axial controls. The gumball is a helpful tool at times, but it's something that we need to be careful because we're always working to model with precision. And using the gumball right now, I'm just arbitrarily moving it any given dimension. Sometimes it's fine to start that way and come back with model with units and measurement, um, but the gumball can be uh, a little bit tricky. The last thing to mention down here, we'll see that I'm currently in feet. So the units can be selected here. You can right click, go to units, and this will bring up all of the document properties inside. We can look at what units we're modeling in. Typically, we're going to want to be in feet or inches. If you want to work in metric, you can, but the best way for us to understand the size and space we're working with is to model in a specific unit. So if I say OK there, I can now draw a line by typing the command line, clicking a point, and then telling it I want a 15 foot long line. You can see now that that line, no matter which way I um, send my second control point, it will always be 15 feet. I can turn ortho on, and you can see now it only goes uh, up, down, left, and right. There's no diagonals allowed. So I can click. That is a 15 foot line. As we work our way through some of the kind of basic principles in the next video, you'll understand better how to use O-snaps, ortho, tracking, and the gumball.